Welcome to the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. Today is August 11th, 2022. My name is Andy Z. I'm the host of the show coming to you from Los Angeles, California. This is a show about nothing less than a real revolution to overthrow the system we live under. This is a big deal. It's serious. It's something that is possible only in rare historic times, and when such times are present, everyone who deep in their hearts abhors all the brutal oppression and exploitation that torments people all over the world needs to learn everything they can about why this is so and what can be done about it, and then bend every effort to free to emancipate all of humanity. This is such a rare time that this is so is coiled together with the grave danger should this opportunity not be seized. We live in a moment of profound crisis, deepening divisions, with the looming possibility of civil war, and all this is tightly bound up with the need and the possibility for a liberating revolution that is urgently needed. And with these coils so tightly wound with the potential to spring loose, will we, will people who see the danger and feel that humanity could be capable of far better, be ready? and know what is happening and why, and what to do to wrench the future onto another road. This relationship between the great danger and great possibility is captured in the title of the seminal work for this historic time by the revolutionary leader Bob Avakian B.A. Something terrible or something truly emancipating, a work that is the map to the road of revolution leading to human emancipation. Towards the beginning of this work, B.A. writes, quote, We live under a system, the system of capitalism imperialism. Capitalism is an economic and political system of exploitation and oppression, and imperialism refers to the worldwide nature of this system. It is this system which is the basic cause of the tremendous suffering that people all over the world are subjected to. And this system, poses a growing threat to the very existence of humanity in the way that this system is rapidly destroying the global environment and in the danger of war between the nuclear-armed capitalist imperialist powers such as the U.S. and China and or Russia. All this is reality, and no one can escape this reality. Either we radically change it in a positive way, or everything will be changed in a very negative way, end quote. Changing things, again quoting, in a positive way means making revolution, a real revolution, to overthrow this system of capitalism and imperialism and replace it with a radically different and emancipating system. For it is also a basic truth that in today's world, to fundamentally change society, you must seize power, overthrow the existing state power, and establish a new state power, end quote. This, an objective scientific understanding of the root of the problem we face, and why B.A. starts there, why an objective scientific understanding of reality matters, is a key theme and subject of today's RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. But before I get into why that is so, know that this work, something terrible or something truly emancipating, goes on to make a penetrating analysis of the current political reality of the deep divisions, including at the very top of the government, where the fascist Republican Party of Trump no longer believes in or upholds the norms that have held this country, yes, with all of its crimes against humanity, together since the time of the Civil War. The divide in the United States intensifies at a rapid clip. Just this past week, the Biden Justice Department had the FBI launch an unprecedented raid on Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate, 18 months after Trump unleashed a vicious mob on the U.S. Capitol. In response to the raid, the fascist hardcore has amped up their rhetoric for a new civil war. Uh, ben, you, you say it's the worst you've seen since January 6th, since before the riot. What kind of posts are you finding online? Uh, just raw violence. That's what we're seeing. People calling for a civil war. 
uh, people explicitly uh, calling for assassinations. Something terrible or something truly emancipating goes on to develop a profound roadmap for how to seize on this moment, an actual strategic approach to organize and to train the forces who today seem far from thinking about an actual revolution in this country, but who could be in the swirl of the coming storms if there is a force to struggle with, prepare for, and organize them for revolution now. But all of that will be the subject for future shows. A moment ago, I paused to stop on the foundational first points from this work that describes the system and the moment we are living in, stating, All this is reality, and no one can escape this reality. Either we radically change it in a positive way, or everything will be changed in a very negative way, end quote. All this is reality that no one can escape. You can either know it to go to work on it, or be played on, or become a victim of it. In the Handbook for Revolution, Basics from the Talks and Writings of Bob Avakian, Chapter 4 is titled, Understanding the World. The first quotation in this chapter is this, quote, Oppressed people who are unable or unwilling to confront reality as it actually is are condemned to remain enslaved and oppressed, end quote. And later in this chapter is this, quote, The truth will not set us free in and of itself, but we will not get free without the truth. We could spend the next three shows or maybe the next three months discussing the profundity and implications of this. Here I will just say that a key reason that we here on the RNL show and the Revcoms overall make such a big deal out of the work that Bob Avakian has done is because the breakthrough he has made in charting the course for revolution leading to the emancipation of humanity lies in this. B.A. has put the already scientific foundation of the science of communism that was first developed by Karl Marx on a qualitatively more consistent and thoroughly scientific foundation, which means that there is a way to know the world as it actually is and on that basis how to change it. We will get into this in different parts of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show today, a focus of which will be the struggle for the right to abortion which has just been taken from women by the theocratic fascist Supreme Court and is a nodal point, a concentration point, of the struggle between the two futures, one life-stealing, fascist, and brutally oppressive, and the other the liberating future possible through a real revolution. Bob Avakian, over decades, identified that this would be a pivotal question, the position of women in society that could not be resolved within the normal framework of this system. And over the last nine months, B.A. has led the Revcoms, and particularly Sansara Taylor, to unite very broadly and with firm principle to organize the organization, rise up for abortion rights, and mobilize masses of people to do all they can to try to stop this by taking to the streets in nonviolent, sustained mass protests. This they did, uniting with people of very diverse political views and involving tens of thousands of people, especially young people, in standing up for this, and really for much more, for not accommodating to this attack. And in the case of Sansara, the Revcoms, and of BA, for standing for, for advocating for, and for bringing to the people the revolutionary solution to all of this and to all the dangers that confront the people of the world today. For all of this, not only was Rise Up for Abortion Rights viciously attacked and libeled by some opportunist leftist pro-choice, really no-choice groups, for their association with Bob Avakian and the Revcoms, but Bob Avakian and the Revcoms are being viciously and dangerously subjected to a barrage of baseless lies and distortions that have been picked up and spread by fascist and law enforcement websites. The last several episodes of the RNL show have taken on these attacks, and later in today's show, since Sarah Taylor will be interviewing the longtime feminist and pioneer of women's health care, Carol Downer, about these attacks. But the heart of today's program is the centrality of the struggle for the scientific method and approach to understand the world as it actually is, and then to tirelessly struggle with masses of people to take up that method to enable them to play the role that they are urgently needed to play today. 
This scientific approach informs the morality, the strategy, and the goal that is at the heart of Babavakian's leadership. This is, to repeat, a scientific, objective method and approach to know and change the world. This can both open the world and how to change it for you and provide the key for you to become a part of organizing the thousands and ultimately the millions needed for a real revolution. We will begin with a short clip of B.A. from the film Why We Need an Actual Revolution and How We Could Really Make a Revolution. Speaking on a scientific understanding of how the oppression of women is bound up with the system of capitalism imperialism. This will be followed by our main commentary this week by our comrade and frequent contributor to the RNL show, Lenny Wolf, on methods, principles, and standards, drawing from an interview that Bob Avakian did in 2012. And we're also going to present a very moving and deep question that comes when you are struggling to make such a profound change in the world with the goal of nothing less than a revolution to emancipate humanity. Bob Avakian answering a question from a young person who asked him, quote, you've dedicated your life to revolution. Have you ever become discouraged? And how do you stay motivated? So with this as an introduction to this, the 114th episode of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show, I want to welcome my co-host and Sarah Taylor back to Los Angeles, California, and the studio of the RNL show. Welcome back. Andy, it's so good to be with you here. Okay, so since Sarah, you're going to be uh, in the today's show, as I said, interviewing uh, Carol Downer, a longtime uh, feminist uh, sc sc scholar, activist, and... and uh, provider of women's health. Um, but then you're also going to be doing something else. Uh, I didn't announce that yet. Yeah, I'll also be talking about the recent major vote in Kansas on an abor anti-abortion referendum and the implications, what lessons to draw, what lessons not to draw for those of us who care about women's fundamental right to abortion. Okay, so with that, we're going to get going with the film clip of Bob Avakian on the oppression of women and how it's tied together with the capitalism. The oppression of women and oppressive gender relations. Not only is white supremacy completely interwoven and tightly stitched together with the development of capitalism in this country, but male supremacy is also completely interwoven and tightly stitched together with the whole historical development of the division between exploiters and exploited, oppressors and oppressed throughout the world including the capitalist imperialist system which is dominant in the world today. Thousands of years ago, with the development of human societies in such a way that means of production, land, domesticated animals, tools, and so on, were no longer the common resource of people, but instead became privately owned. And with the division of labor resulting in women being responsible for child rearing, and men dominating ownership of these means of production and wanting to pass this along to their male heirs and not someone else's, this led to the dominance of the patriarchal family, with the man having power over his wife or wives and children, and women in society overall being subordinate to men, with all the brutality and terror, both mental and physical, that has been used to enforce this, and the whole ideology and culture of male supremacy and misogyny regarding women as lesser, despised beings whose essential purpose is to serve men, that has rationalized and reinforced this inequality and oppression. This patriarchal oppression has also been bound up with the suppression and punishment of relations among people, including intimate relations, that run counter to and challenge traditional gender relations. It is crucial that there be determined struggle against this terrible oppression in all of its manifestations. But in order to finally abolish and move beyond all this, in society as a whole, and not just in one country, but for all of humanity, it is necessary to abolish the private ownership of the means of production, converting them into the common property of the people as a whole, and to replace the traditional patriarchal family with relations among people, including intimate relations, 
that are freely entered into and freed from all vestiges of oppression. This, of course, is impossible under capitalism. Only through the revolution to overthrow this system and uproot all relations of exploitation and oppression that are embodied in this system will it be possible to finally end the fundamental division in which half of humanity is subordinated to and dominated by the other half and all the brutality and agony bound up with that. This is why in the new socialist society that will be brought into being with the overthrow of capitalism, the goal as set forth in the Constitution for the new socialist republic in North America must be to overcome all traditions chains embodied in traditional gender roles and divisions and all the oppressive relations bound up with this in every sphere of society and to enable women as fully as men to take part in and contribute to every aspect of the struggle to transform society and the world in order to uproot and abolish all relations of oppression and exploitation and emancipate humanity as a whole. Over the past eight months, Rise Up for Abortion Rights waged sustained, militant, in-the-street struggle, putting their bodies on the line, first to prevent and then to protest the Supreme Court's outlawing of abortion. The Revcoms, especially Sansara Taylor, played a significant role in that struggle. This ruling was illegitimate. It must not be accepted. And people in this country need to stand up now, fill these streets, and demand that the U.S. government at the federal level restore nationwide legal abortion. And Bob Avakian wrote a number of critical articles during that period that provided important insight and valuable leadership. Unfortunately, too many groups and individuals that should have known better stood aside from that struggle. But then, the day after the decision, a number of groups launched attacks on Rise Up, as well as the Revcoms, Sansara Taylor and Bob Avakian. The sharpest edge of the attack, which was then picked up and amplified by a number of news platforms across the political spectrum, was that the Revcoms and BA were supposedly running a cult and that Rise Up was supposedly being used in a pyramid scheme. These lies have been refuted by Rise Up and the Revcoms and on this show. But ask yourself, why are they attacking by trying to stigmatize BA, using the scare word cult instead of honestly taking on his arguments. I mean, think about it. If you found out that someone said they actually had a way out of this mess. Let's get down to basics. We need a revolution. Anything else in a final analysis is bullshit. <laughs> that they had backed it up with real world research and scientific analysis that was both tight and very wide ranging and expansive wouldn't you want to find out about it? If it turned out he had something powerful to say, wouldn't you want to tell everybody about it? And if people were walking around in a world of hurt and saw no way out of it, except to scratch and claw against each other, or maybe at best, fight for some minor improvements here and there that wouldn't even begin to correctly identify, let alone deal with the problem, wouldn't you want to shake them awake and say, hey, stop that stuff. There's a leader here with a way out. And if somebody thought that way out was wrong or false, wouldn't you think they'd try to make a reasoned argument against it? That's because if you're somebody who's working on the problem of how we get out of this for real, or if you're somebody who's working with all your heart to fight the power and make things better, but you're not sure about revolution, you're not sure what the heart of the problem is, and you want to raise questions and differences, then wouldn't you want to hear that content debated? Wouldn't you want to get out of slanders and gossip and anonymous sources? 
and get into the substance of things? Wouldn't you want to hear this debated in a way in which both sides brought their best arguments so you and others could figure out what was actually true? This week we ran an interview on Revcom with Bob Avakian from a few years back. A great piece it's from a larger piece called What Humanity Needs, Revolution in the New Communism. And part of this interview, the part that we've excerpted, goes into how we should have those debates over the way forward. What it means to approach that with a scientific method and with largeness of mind and generosity of spirit, to quote B.A. And how do you do that in a way that is up here about what is true and what is not true? What is going to get people free and what is not? And not down there with all kinds of accusations that just degrade and demoralize everyone and get you further away from the truth. Bob Avakian also talks in this interview about what happens when people don't do that, including how the state and the political police can fish around there and goad people into doing real foul stuff to each other. Not only does that lead away from the kind of debate that can deepen understanding, that's had a tremendous cost to the people over the years, and we just can't afford to let them play the same foul stuff against us again. The people that you've heard on the show this past week and today are the many more statements of support and defense that you can read at Revcom from all different political perspectives. Know that there's someone worth defending here and someone worth listening to and seriously grappling with. Some of these people remember or they've studied the bitter experience of the 1960s when people paid in blood for lessons on how not to conduct struggle. They're not doing this because they're into idol worship, but because they seriously want to change this world. And they know this is a voice that needs to be heard and defended from unprincipled attack and, yes, from repression. And there are also some people and forces who are mainly saying that this kind of anti-communism and slander and divisiveness should have no place in the movement or in social discourse more generally. And that stand is also righteous and very important these days. But if some people in social forces are trying so hard to keep people from even getting into this, and if instead of principled debate, they're making charges that are really dangerous, and it seems like inviting the authorities in to come mess with this, you got to ask yourself, why? And more than that, you got to tell them no. Here I'm going to read from the interview itself. Bob Avakian says, people have to fight to make the focus of things. What is the way we're going to actually understand the world and change the world? There's also a fight to have the standard be that other stuff, that tabloidism, that low-life gossiping, slander, and rumor-mongering, the personal backbiting, and the rest of that. We don't want that. That doesn't go here. We're about something serious here. We're about trying to make a new world, and that other stuff is part of the old world we need to get rid of. If you have a criticism of somebody, let's raise it up to the level of things that really matter. He goes on to say, it will not get things onto the level where they need to be, but will actually drag them down and away from what needs to be focused on if when an individual or group forthrightly puts forward its views and aims, instead of responding to the substance of this, it is answered by accusing them of arrogance for putting this forward, or trying to dismiss them as a cult, or demanding, who, who are you to say that you know what the problem is and what should be done? Instead, the focus needs to be on what does this person or group stand for? What does that other person or group stand for? And which one, if either of them, 
really is in correspondence with reality and with the interests of humanity, and which is not, or which ones go part way and then back, and which ones can actually break through and go where we need to go. Look, right now we are living in a death-bound, what they call a moribund society. This disease of capitalism imperialism has reached a potentially terminal stage. There may not be much time we have left. And here you have these opportunists and worse, who are like totally unscientific faith healers in the middle of a deadly epidemic, peddling you stuff to make you feel better while the clock ticks down. Maybe they're telling you how you should rename your symptoms to think more positively about what's actually in the process of killing you, or how you should get together in support groups where people may be very acutely suffering from this or that symptom of the underlying disease, but nobody really knows what causes it or what cures it or how to find that out. So all you can do is make each other feel better while the clock ticks down and you try to block that out of your mind. Instead of looking into and confronting the radical diagnosis and the life-saving, if risky, surgery you need that has a chance of curing this condition. So naturally, the last thing these faith-healing charlatans would want is debate about what is the problem and what is the solution. The last thing they want is a debate over what is the scientific method and approach and how does it apply to understanding and transforming society. That diagnosis and the prescription for what to do is found not only in the entire body of work of Bob Avakian, it's found right now very in particular in his talk, something terrible or something truly emancipating. Because the fact is that with this disease, within the very acuteness of it right now, lies the possibility of the cure, the cure of revolution. Again, something terrible or something truly emancipating, which will it be? This fight over leadership and the need to defend that leadership, this fight over principle and the need to uphold principle, this fight over standards and the need to insist on these standards, these are all parts of a larger fight. The fight to not only make revolution in this time, but to get beyond this society with the horrific and needless conditions it subjects people to and the putrid values it gives rise to. And yes, the way it suppresses and works against people knowing the truth. So I'll end this with how B.A. ends this section of the interview. Quote, we are going to struggle in the culture at large to tell people, let's get out of that cesspool and let's get up here into the realm of the future of humanity. And over that, yes, let's have lots of very sharp but principled struggle about the substance of what humanity's up against and the substance of what we need to do about it. Uh, my question is, I'm new to this, so I approach people uh, about revolution. I get different, different things come to me, like, oh, we go through this all the time, whatever. Um, have you ever been in a point in your time, you've been doing this pretty much all your life, you dedicated your life to this. Um, my question is, have you ever been like um, discouraged at the time or feel like you had a roadblock, and what did you do to keep yourself going and motivated? Uh, yes, <laughs> more more than once. You know, you you know, you do. You t look. You know, you tear your hair out because you know this. All the things we're talking about we, that we've been just talking about work against what we're trying to do. The dominant media, the way people are conditioned. 
you know, you go to a you go to a school to try to hook up with the youth and bring revolution to them, and the administrators come out. Many times they're black administrators, who, you know, who should you know m maybe you feel no better, and they start slandering you. You know, it's like it's really hard out there, okay? Because you're dealing with a, with, you know, I mean, look, one of the things that that you know we've had to work through is. I, you know, we've talked about the upsurge of the 60s, right? Well, what happened? It didn't go where it needed to go. You know, and because it didn't go where it didn't go all the way to revolution for the reasons that I, you know, spoke to and we could get into more deeply, but, you know, it just didn't. It didn't go where it needed to go. So then what you, you not only then are left with the same system, but you're left with a ruling class that's going to take revenge on everything that people fought for in that time. And they've been doing not only the concrete things, but the ideas, too, that came out. And they've been on a, you know, and then in, in the world of that time, I talked about the Vietnam War. You had people fighting in all these third world countries against the colonialists, against the imperialists. You had China, which was a socialist country with one-fourth or one-fifth of the world's population, doing, you know, making some mistakes, but doing tremendous things as the main thing going on. So, you know, people were very inspired at that time. And, you know, I, I've told a story before, but the first time that I... You want to stay standing? I'm, I'm going to talk. I can see you better. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> That's all right. If it's, if it's okay with you, it's okay with me. But I was... Uh, no, it's fine. You can stay up. I just, I just didn't want you to get tired. That's all. <laughs> Okay, fine, that's good. But I was just saying, I've told this story before. The first time I met Huey Newton was, you know, I went to this, a friend of mine told me about this cultural program, African-American cultural program at a community college in Oakland. So I, I went there and, you know, I was out in the hallway or whatever and, and uh, this guy came up to me, it turned out to be Huey Newton and I, I think I was one of, at the most, two white people, in, you know, who were attending this program so he came up to me, I had a beard, you know, and he came up to me and he said, who are you, Socrates? <laughs> I, I, I guess he thought I looked philosophical or something, you know. So I said, no. <laughs> and then he said, and then he started asking me, are you with this group? And I, he, I said, no. And he said, well, that's good, they're not revolutionary. Are you with that, are you with that group? No. I, I said, no, that's good, they're not revolutionary. And then he started running down about how he saw the revolution and he said, look in the world, we got the third world you know, it makes up two-thirds or three-fourths of the population in the world. All those people are with us. If you just look inside of America, this is also, you know, came from Malcolm X and what. If you just look at uh, inside America, we might be a minority, but if you look at uh, the whole world, most of the world is with us, so that's why we can make a revolution here. Now, you know, looking back on it, look, uh, Huey Newton had a very positive influence on me, turning me toward revolution. But looking back on it, that was pretty naive. You know, that's not the way you're going to be able to deal with this system, you know, here or even in the world as a whole. But that was like an idea that a lot of people g gravitated toward. It's sort of, we had this idea that more, we were going in, you know, things were going in a good direction. You're going more and more toward revolution. And it was just kind of grow and grow and grow and more and more people were going to get with it. And eventually, somehow, this was going to turn the whole thing over. And... You know, that didn't happen. You know, the, the, you have to come up against the fact these po people hold power. They have these powerful instru institutions and instruments of suppressing anybody who, who opposes them. They have the media, which we were just talking about, to, to manipulate people and to slander people. But they also have their, their, you know, their ultimate power, the military and everything else. And, and so you're not going to just make a revolution by more and more people getting with it. And so... Then the world changes. You know, China becomes no longer socialist. You got people who still call themselves communists, but they're just capitalists. You know, that, that's what they're doing in China. So that's not a revolutionary country anymore. Uh, you know, and the Vietnam War ended. The, the U.S. was defeated, but things didn't really go well in Vietnam. You know, I, I want to go into all of it because it takes too long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, things were, th you know, so people got, people got demoralized and disoriented. And a lot of people who were with it, because they had a naive notion of how this was all going to go. And so, when you add on top of that, that the people who were the, you know, the, you know, the ones in power, who'd been challenged in a very fundamental way during this upsurge of the 60s and early 70s, you know, they weren't just going to take this. They went on a whole thing of revenge 
against all of the positive ideas, especially the radical ideas that came, that came to the fore in that period of the 60s. They went on a whole thing about China and how terrible Mao was. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, if you play poker, you know, you play poker and you say, okay, I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bet 300 and then somebody else put, okay, I'll see your 300 and raise it 500. Well, the, the, you know, the, the intellectual hatchet men of this ruling class have done a similar thing with China. Mao killed 10 million people. I'll see your 10 million and raise it 20. Mao <laughs> killed 30 million people. I'll see your 30 and raise it 15. Mao killed 45 million people. I mean, you know, and just slander after slander after slander, you know. Uh, and, you know, all this has an effect on people. And, you know, so, you know, you have to, you have, to have a scientific approach to actually say, well, let's look at, let's really look into this. I mean, we've done a lot of study of what, ha what actually happened in China. And also what happened in the Soviet Union, which was socialist for a while, even though they made a lot more mistakes because they were the first socialist country and they had a lot of difficulties. And they, made, and, they, and they also had some wrong methods that led to some, you know, sometimes even grievous, you know, things that they did. But we've, looked, we've done a lot of work to look into what was the actual history of this. You know, I looked, uh, one time I got a book in Barnes and Nobles. And I looked at, you know, I, I'm starting to read, and here it goes again. Mao killed 30 million people. <laughs> so I said, okay, where's the footnote? I went to the footnote, and th there's no primary source. It's just like a reference to another book. I went to an, uh, the other book that it referenced, and there's just a reference to another book. There's never any primary, there's never anybody actually said, here's a study that shows this. And you know, they do things like, the, when they add up the people that supposedly were, died during the Great Leap Forward in China, they, they count the people who were not born as if they were people who were killed. In other words, because there was some, you know, there was some suffering then, some hardship, People had fewer children. So then those are counted as people who were killed by Mao, people who were never even born. No, this is the kind of stuff they do. They, you know, they take revenge on, on this because you, for obvious reasons. Because this, is a, this was a pole, of, a magnet of attraction for people all over the world. So, you know, this, this, is, this is worn on the revolutionaries, including in this country, including in our own party. And I found that discouraging. Not, not what the ruling class was doing, but the fact that even within our own party, people were you know, starting to give up on revolution. That's why we had to have a cultural revolution in our party to, to you know, say no. You know, let's, go back to the, let's go back to the science here. You know, can, can we solve these problems that we all say we hate under this system? You know, scientifically, let's look at it. Can we? No. You know, if there have been difficulties in how we've tried to make revolution, let's look at those scientifically. Let's look at what actually happened. And then figure out, you know, what lessons need to be drawn from that. That's the whole point of this new communism is sifting through that experience as well as looking at broader human experience and different fields and science and art and different things and trying to, you know, working to get a deeper understanding on the basis of scientifically going back to basics and saying, well, it, were we wrong? Do, it, do you really, can you really reform this system and make it okay for people? Not just here, but around the world. No. If you look at it scientifically, you get an even deeper understanding that you cannot do that. You need a revolution. So, you know, yes. <laughs> Some of this is very discouraging. It's discouraging that we, that we have, you know, that these... Great upsurge didn't lead to the revolution that it should have led to, or at least it should have attempted to go to. It's discouraging that the ruling class has been able to take such revenge on everything positive you know, that came out of that whole period. It's discouraging that even communists who should n have known better got influenced by that and started thinking, well, maybe, you know, this democracy is the best that people can do and blah, blah, blah. Those things are discouraging, but you have to go back to the basics. What is the problem that humanity faces and what is the solution to that and how do we scientifically determine that? And if you, if you do that, you will see that the problem is this system we live under. There are other forces out there in the world who are no good. <clears throat> but the fundamental problem, which sort of it, you know, takes in all of this, is the system we live under. And the solution is, is, to, is to overthrow the system and to bring into being a socialist system and ultimately a communist world without all this stuff, 
And, you know, it's not going to be utopia. Everything's not going to be perfect. You know, there's still going to be conflicts. You know, I mean, not violent conflicts, but, you know, differences among people, struggles among people. But that is the fundamental, if you go to it scientifically, that is the fundamental problem and that is the fundamental solution. So we have to go to work even harder and with more determination and with more scientific approach, even though we, even though much of that is discouraging. You know, I feel like I, met, I imagine almost all of you do. I can't stand living in this goddamn place, you know, this country, this world. Every day, there's something else that you just want to, you know, smash something. You know, you just want to smash something, you know, and, and, you know, so you, but what do you do? You know, you could smash something, but then after you've done that, things are still the same. So you got to really go to work on this scientifically to figure out how can we actually do this. You know, and the reason that I, you know, discouragement or not, the reason you fight through the discouragement and don't give up is because you keep coming back to the problem and solution. And if I didn't think there was a solution, if I really had to come to the conclusion that there was no way that anything better could be brought into being, then I suppose I would give up. You know, I probably would... <laughs> <laughs> break a bunch of things, you know? But, but I scientifically am convinced that there is a solution, hard as it is, and that we have to go to work on it even, even harder ourselves. Earlier, Lenny Wolf talked about the vicious, unprincipled, libelous attacks on Rise Up for Abortion Rights, on the Revcoms, on myself, and on the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian. And at Revcom.us, we have the official responses from Rise Up for Abortion Rights and from the Revcoms to these attacks, as well as a whole breadth of statements from people from different perspectives taking on these attacks. And we encourage you to go to Revcom.us to read these responses, to spread them, and to send in your own and solicit more. Last week, we began featuring some of these in video form, and this week we want to bring two more to you. Um, the first is going to be read by a member of the RNL, Revolution Nothing Less Crew, is from D. Ocean, a medical health provider. Then we are going to share with you a video statement from Gloria Pinex, who is the mother of Darius Pinex, who is murdered by Chicago police, who is sending her message as well. And that will be followed by an interview that I did with Carol Downer, a longtime feminist healthcare provider and activist. Um, who has a statement at revcom.us in response to these attacks, and we're going to talk about it in my interview. And all that will be followed by our final segment today, which I go into the recent showdown in Kansas around abortion rights and the larger lessons to draw from that. So let's continue. When Bob Avakian and the Revcoms take a principled position, and cut through the bullshit. When they show this attack on women and the overturning of Roe vs. Wade is a fascist attack. When they show how the Democratic Party is conciliatory with these fascists, refusing to mobilize the people. When in contrast to giving in and capitulating, RU4AR mobilizes thousands of young women. It is at this point these forces go after Bob Avakian. Because he is telling people what is behind the curtain. Vicious attacks on Sansara Taylor because she took a stand. When Rise Up for Abortion Rights started, Sansara Taylor and others from Revcom made it clear. We have to hit this and we have to hit this hard and mobilize the masses to fight to make sure things don't get to where they've gotten. With Roe v. Wade overturned and new horrors now happening. The forces who launched this attack have no answer other than to pretend these attacks are not as serious as they are. Their program is bankrupt. Which side are you on? But more. This is counter-revolution. Accusations about misappropriation of funds is being spread. This is an attempt to discredit, to delegitimize, to create suspicion. This can do damage by creating distrust among people who don't know the real. It's all old game, but it can be effective. Rather than a solidarity movement, 
Look how the forces spreading lies about BA and Revcom have sunk to the level of Alex Jones. Let's be real. The forces spreading this disinformation despise the very idea of revolution. So much so that they envy the shock jock Alex Jones and want to be him. Spreading lies, slander, and disinformation. More than shameful, attempting to destroy legitimate protest? This is what fascism does. Since when do cults fight to liberate women, black people, LGBTQ, and wage the fight against capitalism and imperialist war? Describe a cult that engages in that. And because people out there can be lazy and won't backcheck, this bullshit cult charge can get over among some. Just blurt out cult. And because people don't practice science, that can also take on wings. Isn't the question whether what BA is saying is true or not, and where it will lead if it is promoted and followed? Of course, none of these leaders of this bourgeois capitalist setup or the self-appointed leaders of the women's movement who spew groundless accusations would endorse Bob Avakian. They would rather have people turn away. Now their mouthpieces, even so-called progressive journalists, work to cut people off from Bob Avakian before his ideas spread, before Bob Avakian's new ideas have a chance to catch on. That is what is happening here. No way should we allow this. Why did Malcolm X place the Republican and Democratic Party leadership in the same canine family, foxes and wolves? And why is that relevant today? This is dangerous. The forces behind these lies and slanders know this. They know about COINTELPRO. They know about Malcolm X. What happened to Malcolm when he said that the Republicans and the Democratic Party, they got the same game going? We know what happened, and that can't be allowed to happen now. It's slander, it's libelous, but I say, listen and read B.A. Look at the facts. Look at his principled approach. Is what B.A. saying true or not? That's the question. Do you disagree? If so, say so. Debate is welcome. I know this from years of experience with the Revcoms. But whether you agree with the need for revolution or not, these counter-revolutionary attacks must be exposed and denounced. Everyone really does need to take a basic stand against this outrage. D. Ocean, Healthcare Practitioner I know B.A. personally. The first time I heard him speak, I fell in love with him. And I don't know why someone wouldn't want to hear from someone who gets down to earth with things. I don't know who wouldn't want the truth. Anything having to do with oppression, he touches on it. He touches bases on police brutality, oppressed women. Yeah, he does a lot. All that gibberish they are talking is absolutely absurd. It's not Bobby. It's not his character. Gloria Pinex. Our next guest has been an anti-racist activist since 1965. She has been a pro-abortion feminist since 1969, and she was a founding member of the collective that established the Feminist Women's Health Centers across California. She was for many years the executive director, and she still is on the board. I'm very happy to bring as a guest on the RNL, the Revolution Nothing Less show, Carol Downer. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here, Sanzara. Wonderful. I also count you as a friend and a, a longtime collaborator in the in the fight for women's right to abortion, as well as other things. And that's brings us to what we want to get into. There's obviously so much that we could talk about, about your work over many years. But today, the occasion of this interview is you wrote a very powerful piece responding to the recent spate of unprincipled, scurrilous, libelous attacks on Rise Up for Abortion Rights on the Revcoms, on myself, and on Bob Avakian, the revolutionary leader. And you brought to bear your really decades of experience working with the Revolutionary Communist Party and the Revcoms from your own perspective. I wanted to start by asking you why you felt compelled to go into print and to take on these attacks. 
Well, first and foremost, they were so blatantly um, based on absolutely not an iota of, of fact. I mean, it's just baseless and so full of, uh, you know, hostility and vengefulness. It, it almost made you wonder what what was their real motive, especially in this time of when we're trying to respond to uh, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I mean, after all, there are, you know, we're this country swinging to the right uh, so fast that it makes you dizzy. And, you know, we know that uh, communists are always first, uh, you know, to attack. Or to be attacked. So naive is to not think that uh, uh, if they did have a problem to solve it in a way that would, would not, uh, you know, expose uh, not just you, but all communist organizations in our country that are working for social reform uh, to, uh, you know, who knows now that everybody can carry hidden guns. And uh, I mean, the way has been paved for them. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it's just the most reckless thing that I had, had run across and that I felt it had to be responded to. Well, I think it was very important that you did. And, and right up front, you say um, that these 23 organizations that attacked Rise Up for Abortion Rights that, that claim that it was a pyramid scheme for the Revcoms, funneling money towards the Revcom leadership and attack Bob Avakian as a cult leader and this kind of thing. Um, it did need to be rebutted, and you're right, it is profoundly dangerous. In the opening of your, uh, of your rebuttal, you say, I want to speak to this as somebody who's worked closely with the Revcoms in different capacities over the years, I wonder if you could share some of your experiences and what you draw from that and how you bring that to bear in refuting these allegations. Um, oh, gladly. Because, um, you know, the, the health centers, in addition to uh, establishing and running abortion clinics around the country, um, we also, um, like the RCP, we are... Uh, engaged in a number of issues. We don't just work on the issue of abortion. We also work on, um, you know, allied reproductive health things, but we also fight against police abuse and we fight against, um, you know, racism uh, and, you know, forced sterilization and all, all kinds of, uh, of issues uh, that come up that affect, uh, you know, uh, all of us. And, that's where I have always had a lot, our groups always had a lot in common with the RCP because, uh, you know, we found ourselves working with you many, many times and you've come to our political educations every year. Uh, I mean, I remember with the, uh, you know, the Break the Chains uh, contingent of, you know, feminists in uh, RCP that, that came, that uh, Becky Chalker and I went to Iran with the RCP in 1979 and um, this was when the, the revolution just happened and the the rcp hosted our trip to demand the hostages back and um, so i got to see the international facets of the rcp too and uh, um, you know i was very amazed and and very impressed by uh, the, the international organization um, you know, and of course, over the years, it's been refuse and resist, uh, you know, and uh, now, of course, you have uh, an end stop patriarchy. And also now uh, with, um, <clears throat> um, you know, this current uh, uh, pro-abortion uh, organization. And um, I mean, uh, so, for some reason, that seems to seem uh, shady to people. I don't. I don't know why, because uh, uh, for one thing, it's extremely transparent and it, it's very effective. Uh, and sometimes it's protesting. I can, the instant case here, I mean, you know, you folks, uh, uh, you know, in Rise Up um, have done a lot of uh, very, very dramatic uh, uh, posting, which they seem to uh, somehow envy you because <laughs> the fact that you've actually managed to uh, get tremendous um, response. I know here at the LA Times, you're on your feature, uh, your, the photographs, you know, abortion now and you know, without apology, you know, it's just, um, 
uh, stock footage now on the uh, LA Times. You know, whenever they cover an abortion issue, it's not only you, but something from one of your demonstrations. Uh, so, um, you know, this son, they somehow want to twist that into something nefarious. And they want to make the fact that um, uh, you have a, a leader, somebody who you, as a group, um, look to to um, provide inspiration and guidance and so forth. Uh, I mean, wh what, what about that is um, nefarious? That, and I, I certainly have never found uh, people in the, uh, the party or in any of the, uh, you know, committee groups that you form, uh, any kind of uh, mindless, you know, followership. I mean, people um, are very open to discuss matters. And I'm a, a very contentious person myself, and I love to get into uh, discussions, and I um, I like to be challenged. I like to, I don't mind having to prove where I'm drawing my thinking from. And um, I find that to be true with RCP members that I, many over the years, have become uh, friends, uh, you know, uh, but all very um, esteemed, you know, colleagues. And um, I think this has got to be um, shown in the light of reality. When you spoke, you said also, you don't mind being challenged in your thinking. You don't mind having an argument. Is this the right way to approach this question, or is it, a, is it the wrong way to understand it? Having that struggle over substance, which I think is very important and very different than the culture today of canceling people you disagree with, internet attacks, tearing them down, spreading lies and slanders, which then get picked up in the media. And I, this is actually a hallmark as well of Bob Avakian to get into the substance of the problems in the world, and how to solve them, and the method to come at this. And in your letter, you also say you've heard Bob Avakian speak, you've read his work. Um, I wonder if you want to comment some on, on the accusation that he's a cult leader up against what you've actually experienced. Well, I run the risk of uh, being called a, a zombie myself, I guess, because <laughs> I, find, I respect um, what, Bob, what Bob has done very much. And I find... Although, as a feminist, I have set my political agenda in a different way, uh, I value his thinking and his leadership. Uh, you know, he has lots of good and, uh, ideas, and I think um, he deserves uh, to be highly respected. Um, and has, over the years, which I've been, you know, attending many of his uh, um, speeches and um, meetings, you know, held where we discuss them and so, so forth. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with them. Uh, but as I say, I'm not focused on uh, choosing, you know, whether a socialist or a communist uh, form of uh, government would be, the, you know, part of the solution. I know it is, but I, myself, I feel like I, I want to focus on getting women to be more equal at this point. Um, but, you know, I want to throw in a little bit about Florence Kennedy. Uh, she was an attorney in, uh, in this, you know, second wave. And she talked about horizontal hostility. And really, this is what we're running into here. Um, and people can, uh, I guess, have called it cancel culture or whatever. It, it has become in vogue. But what it is is just... Uh, it's giving people a very false um, sense that uh, they can just sort of bully other people into thinking as they do and uh, defining things and so forth. You know, rather than um, put, putting out their ideas and letting them get tested, mm -hmm. uh, it just seems to be like uh, who, who has the most... Uh, um, what do you call it? And when you say you like, how many likes you have? If you get a million likes, well, then you're going to win. Well, that's not true. Uh, anyway, I mean, we have a, a battle to fight, and it's with people in power, uh, people that are really wrecking our lives. So, Carol, I have one last question I want to ask. 
Uh, you lived through the 1960s, the 70s, the period when both the high tide of revolution and women's liberation movements in this country, but also when there was tremendous government repression, which really has not stopped. But it was there were lessons learned with COINTELPRO, with some of the battles up against the force of the state. And I wonder if you have any perspective you want to share about the harm that these, this kind of attacks that have been waged against the Revcoms, against the revolutionary leader Bob Avakian, against Rise Up for Abortion Rights, um, from others in the so-called movement, how this feeds into and sets a dangerous situation for that kind of repression. We are on the cusp of this being the reality here. And it, you know, it's just a very dangerous thing to be um, somehow indicating that some people uh, are are just not in the fold, and then they you can go out and attack them, and nobody will stick up for them. You know, nobody will try to uh, bring them into this larger discussion. You know, put them in the, like like they're, and which of course never is correct, uh, as I've just said. I mean, uh, RCP has been right in the <laughs> the thick of things always, um, but. It and any other organization that they deem to be dangerous suddenly becomes a top target. And I think we have many, many um, martyrs, whether it's Fred Hampton, whether it's uh, Martin Luther King. I mean, we, we, we've got enough to realize that, um, um, you know, we, we just have to realize that um, um, the people that run this society are ruthless they're organized they have the power and if you paying attention to this latest supreme court decisions you can see that they are laying the groundwork right in front of our eyes uh, you know for great repression so it's in, it's essential for us to um, get more politically sophisticated i do think some of this is um just lack of historical memory, <laughs> you know, um, maybe they think we made these things up. So to my mind, it, it was uh, a very urgent way that I, a need for me to spend my time and energy was uh, going after this um, baseless attack. Yeah. Well, Carol, I really want to thank you for taking the time spending the time responding to the attacks, setting a standard, it's, it's incredibly important, and for taking the time to join us here on the Revolution Nothing Less show. Okay, you're perfectly welcome. Enjoy it. On Tuesday, August 2nd, voters in Kansas overwhelmingly rejected a proposed amendment to the state constitution that would have opened the pathway for extreme anti-abortion bans. This is good, because at least for now, Women across Kansas, and some in the surrounding states where abortion has recently been banned, will be able to access abortion in Kansas. But it is crucial to draw the right lessons from this experience, and not the wrong lessons. So here are four important points. First, there is a tremendous reservoir of potential fury, commitment, and determination among millions and millions of women and others throughout society to fight for abortion rights and for women's liberation. The energy and passion with which a great many women and others campaigned against this Kansas amendment provides a window into the depth of fury and energy and commitment that could be and needs to urgently be unleashed in a massive struggle in the streets to win back the legal right to abortion nationwide. And this includes many not only in the progressive pockets and urban areas of this red state and others, there are also deep contradictions, even within the solid core of fascist supporters, especially among the women whose lives have depended on access to abortion and birth control. This, re this reveals the potential for serious repolarization on this question, if it is fought for decisively. And this leads me to the second big lesson. In order to call forward the fight that is needed, we have to sharpen up the truth that the fight over abortion is about whether women will be enslaved or emancipated. Forcing women to have children against their will is a form of enslavement, 
Women need abortion on demand and without apology. And this needs to be fought for boldly. But this is the exact opposite of what the major voices of the Democratic Party and the so-called movement that is slavishly tied to them has been doing, including in this recent vote in Kansas. The publication, The Economist, summed up the approach taken by the pro-choice establishment in this way. Quote, The pro-choice campaign triumphed through smart strategy instead of slogans explicitly about abortion. It emphasized personal liberty and privacy. The front of the main leaflet distributed by Kansans for Constitutional Freedom, the cannily named group opposing the amendment, simply read, It's up to us to keep Kansans free. Television ads urged viewers to say no to more government control. Say no to more government control. The pro-choice side prevailed in part by running ads framing this as a rights issue, borrowing language from opponents of COVID lockdowns. It's a strict government mandate. This is not the smart strategy. This is a losing strategy. It accepts and reinforces the terms set by the fascists. It accelerates their assault and disorients and demobilizes those who support abortion rights. And the Democrats and way too much of the so-called pro-choice movement have been taking this kind of approach for decades, demobilizing people away from the streets, channeling them instead into one election after another on defensive terms, when what is urgently needed is calling for the fury of women and all who care about justice to stand up against this fascist assault and change the terms throughout society in favor of justice and liberation. Meanwhile, through this whole time, the fascists have never gone off the offense, screaming that abortion is murder and setting doctors up to be assassinated. Killing babies in America. That's the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. For $5,000, Tiller, the baby killer, as some call him, will perform a late-term abortion for just about any reason. So this man, Dr. George Tiller, known as Tiller the Baby Killer, is performing late-term abortions without defining the specific medical reasons why. Sandra County 911. Hey, somebody just came in and shot him in our church. Somebody shot someone? Yes, Dr. Tiller. Dr. George Tiller was just shot. They've captured key levers of the state and built up a movement that refuses to be bound by the laws as we have known them. An abortion facility was hit by a bomb blast. Bomb blasts at three abortion clinics. 28 abortion clinics and information centers have been bombed or set afire. The gunman shot four people before escaping here. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. Third. The fight over abortion is not momentary or superficial. It is not just about who will come out ahead in one or another election cycle. This fight is deeply rooted in the oppression of women and the patriarchal family. And these are deeply rooted in the system of capitalism and imperialism that we live under in this country. In the last several generations, Owing both to major economic changes in the U.S. and around the world, as well as to the tremendous struggle that women have waged for their liberation, women have entered into public life and into work in ways that would have been unimaginable before. And there have been huge changes in the institution of the family. And none of this would have been possible without access to abortion and to birth control. Yet, as Bob Avakian wrote in his 2021 New Year's statement, quote, the elimination of male supremacy is impossible within the confines of this system. This is true because male supremacy has been deeply woven into the fabric of this society and because this system is based on capitalist commodity relations and exploitation. Things are produced to be exchanged or sold through a process in which masses of people work for a wage or salary to create profit that is accumulated by capitalists who employ them and control their work. A system in which the patriarchal family unit remains an essential economic and social component and requirement, even as it is being put, put under increasing strains. And the fascist section of the ruling class has over a number of decades now, waged a relentless attack 
on constitutional rights and mobilize their social base of religious fundamentalist fanatics to forcefully and often violently assert traditional patriarchal oppression with the assault on the right to abortion and even birth control, a major focus of this attempt to essentially enslave women. End quote. Putting an end to the oppression of women and fully defeating this Christian fascist assault on abortion will take a revolution, overthrowing this system in which this oppression is rooted. So finally, point four, a radical resolution is coming. Whatever temporary setbacks or local defeats these Christian fascists may suffer along the way, and let's be clear, right now, in state after state, they are mainly succeeding in banning abortion. They are not going to relent until they are decisively defeated. Just a few days after the Kansas vote, Indiana effectively wiped out the right to abortion in that state. As Bob Avakian went on to quote from an earlier work of his in that New Year's statement, quote, the whole question of the position and role of women in society is more and more acutely posing itself in today's extreme circumstances. This is a powder keg in the U.S. today. It is not conceivable that all this will find any resolution other than in the most radical terms and through extremely violent means. The question yet to be determined is will it be a radical reactionary or a radical revolutionary resolution? Will it mean the reinforcing of the chains of enslavement or the shattering of the most decisive links in those chains and the opening up of the possibility of realizing the complete elimination of all forms of such enslavement? End quote. It is time for all those who care about women and all those who love justice to cast off illusions and prepare for struggle to unleash the fury of women as a powerful force standing up against this fascist tide and demanding legal abortion on demand and without apology nationwide. To unite all who can be united in this fight from many diverse perspectives as is being done and fought for by Rise Up for Abortion Rights and for growing numbers of people to wage this fight as an organized part of the movement for revolution so that we can truly and finally Break all the chains. All right, this has brought us to the end of today's episode of the RNL, the Revolution Nothing Less show. I want to remind you to spread this show, to share it with others, to gather people, to watch it together, and to let us know what you learned, what you, th what you think, what was provoked in you by this show. Leave a comment, leave a question in the comments below. This will also strengthen the algorithm and help other people see this. We're in the middle of a campaign to increase the viewership of this show as a decisive part of building and spreading the movement for a revolution that is so urgently needed. So with that, I want to remind you, we'll be back next week at 5 o'clock Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. And we have a treat for you as we send you out for the night. Um, you may have heard this song being played at fascist Republican rallies for years. Um, recently, Carrie Lake, a fascist uh, election, you know, stolen election proponent, a Trump supporter in Arizona, has been using it. And uh, the singer-songwriter came out and denounced this. Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister, who wrote the song, We're Not Gonna Take It, came out on Twitter and said, Hey, idiots, read the first line. We've got the right to choose. This is a pro-choice anthem you are co-opting. It was never intended for you fascist morons. As the songwriter and singer, I denounced everything that Carrie Lake stands for. Write your own damn song. So with that, we want to play a little bit of that song. And as he, claim, as he proclaims it's a pro-choice anthem, we will put it to footage of people rising up for abortion rights. <laughs>